Hello students, welcome back to my channel. In the previous class, we are discussing about the pollination. You know the pollination, it is the transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma. So, transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma, it is called as a pollination. And the pollination is mainly classified into two types, self-pollination and cross-pollination. Again, self-pollination can be divided into two types, autogamy and gyprogamy. Let us recall the other aspects we studied in the previous class. So, autogamy. Autogamy is the transfer of pollen grains from anther to the stigma of the same flower. Such a condition is called as autogamy. For example, in the previous class only, I told you this is the stigma and here is the anther which contain pollen grains. If the transfer of pollen grains, whatever the pollen grains which are present in the anther, so these pollen grains will be transferred onto the stigma within the same flower, it is called as autogamy. The transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma of the same flower, it is called as autogamy. Then what do you mean by gyrinogamy? It is the transfer of pollen grains. The transfer of pollen grains from anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower. So this is the stigma of another flower. Here the transfer of pollen grains will be taking place from one flower to another flower of the same plant. This is nothing but gyrinogamy. The differences are very clear. If the within the same flower, the, poly, uh, the transfer of pollen grains is taking place, it is called as self-pollination. If the pollination taking place between two different flowers of the same plant, it is called as gyrinogamy. I repeat the definition, the transfer of pollen grains from anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower of the same plant is called as gyrinogamy. Hence, gyrinogamy is genetically similar to autogamy because the pollen grains comes from the same plant. So, these are the aspects we covered in the previous class. In this class, we will be talking about the cross pollination, which can also be called as xenogamy or also called as allogamy. Cross pollination can also be called as xenogamy or allogamy. Then, what is xenogamy? So, this xenogamy is nothing but the transfer of pollen grains from anther of one flower of one plant to the stigma of another flower of another plant of the same species is called as xenogamy. I will show you. You just imagine this is one plant, this is another plant but both, but both the plants belong to the same species. So here it is a species specific, uh, the transfer of pollen grains will be taking place. Let us imagine, this is a, a plant A, a plant B, both belongs to same species. So same species in the sense, if you are taking hibiscus rosa sinensis, both should be hibiscus rosa sinensis, like that. So in this plant A, there is a flower, here also in the plant B, there is a flower. So now, the pollen grains which are present in this flower, of this plant will be transferred to the stigma of this flower of this plant. This is called as a xenogamy. Here very really, very really important. Both should be same species. So the transfer of pollen grains of one flower of one plant to the stigma of another flower of another plant of same species is called as xenogamy or allogamy or simply we can call it as cross pollination and this cross pollination usually it will bring variations as two different plants are involved there will be a genetic recombination results in variations and these variations are very very useful for adjustment with the changing environmental conditions but this cross pollination is performed by certain external agencies. External agencies. So here the pollen grains must be transferred from one plant to another plant means here they require certain external agencies. We we'll see which are the agents for pollination. And these agencies, they may be abiotic agencies or 
biotic agencies. So abiotic in the sense non-living and biotic refers to living. So the, uh, these agencies, uh, for example, there are two main types of abiotic agencies, namely wind and water. So there are two abiotic agencies or agents which will bring about the cross-pollination. Very very important, the cross-pollination must be carried out by certain agencies. But in, in case of self-pollination, they do not require any pollinators or external agencies. But here it is required. So as I said, the abiotic agents are wind and water. And these biotic agencies are usually animals. So again we can classify different types of animals and we can give some certain specific terms for each type of pollination depending upon the pollinating agent. So depending upon the pollinating agent we can give a specific term, a scientific term for each type of pollination. For example, if pollination takes place by wind, if pollination takes place by wind, such a pollination is called as anemophily. Pollination takes place by wind, which is called as anemophily. And pollination takes place by water, is called as hydrophily. So what is anemophily? The pollination taking place by wind. And hydrophily refers to pollination taking place by water. And the biotic agents, agencies, as I said, these, these are usually animals. If a pollination taking place by animals, it is called as zoophily. Pollination taking place by animals is called as zoophily. Then, which are the animals which are mainly involved in the transfer of pollen grains or which are mainly involved in pollination? Maybe the examples include rodents, garden lizard, lemur, etc. And again, under zoophily, we can we can have different types like entomophily. Entomophily, I will write these uh, different types of here. So, entomophily. So, what is entomophily? The pollination which takes place by the agency of insects. The insect pollination is nothing but entomophily. So, entomophily is nothing but the pollination takes place by the agency of insects. If pollination takes place by the agency of birds, which can be called as ornithophily. If pollination takes place by birds, which is called as ornithophily. Similarly, if the pollination takes place by bats, it is called as chiropterophily. Chiropterophily. If pollination takes place by snakes, which will be called as malacophily. Malacophily. If pollination takes place by the agency of ants, which can be called as myrmacophily. So I repeat. So here cross pollination will be carried out by or performed by certain external agencies and these agents may be abiotic or biotic agencies. Let us give few examples. So abiotic agencies, there are two abiotic agencies namely wind and water. If a pollination takes place by wind which will be called as anemophily. If a pollination takes place by water which is called as hydrophily. And if pollination takes place by animals, which is commonly called as zoophily, again under zoophily we have different types. Entomophily, the pollination by insects. And pollination by birds is called as ornithophily. Pollination by bats is called as chiropterophily. If pollination by snakes, it is called as melacophily. And pollination by ants is called as myrmacophily. And we will be discussing all these agencies in detail. Firstly, we will be talking about the anemophily. So, firstly, we are discussing anemophily. Then, what is anemophily? The pollination takes place by the agency of wind. It is called as anemophily. Don't get confused. Anemophily. 
anemophily. If, you, if the name is anemophily, you cannot say the pollination by animals. You should remember anemophily is the pollination which takes place by the agency of wind. So pollination takes place by the agency of wind. And the flowers which are pollinated by wind are called as anemophilous flowers. They are called as anemophilous flowers. We can give example maize, grasses, etc. So anemophily, it is the pollination takes place by the agency of wind and the flowers that are pollinated by wind are called as anemophilous flowers and examples include maize, grasses, etc. And here importantly we should know the characteristic features of anemophilous flowers. If the flowers are pollinated by the agency of wind, the flowers should contain certain characteristic features. Then which are the characteristic features? We will see. So usually in case of anemophilous flowers, the flowers are usually small and without nectar, without color and without smell. So in case of anemophilous flowers, we can see a small flowers without color, nectar, smell etc. And many small flowers are packed into an inflorescence. You know that inflorescence is nothing but a cluster or a group of flowers. Similarly, even in case of anemophilous flowers, the small flowers are packed into inflorescence. And these flowers, they usually, they contain a well-exposed anthers. The anthers can be clearly visible. They are well-exposed. And those anthers produce a many number of pollen grains. The anthers will produce a many number of pollen grains. And the characteristic feature of pollen grains is also very, very important because the pollens produced in these anemophilous flowers are usually small, they are lightweight, they are dry or non-sticky, and they are powdery in nature. I repeat, the pollen grains are small, light in weight, they are dry or non-sticky, and even they look like a powdery in nature. And what about the stigma? Even the stigma is large. In these plants, stigma is large, usually which is feathery and sticky. The stigma looks like feathery and sticky. Why it is sticky? It has to catch the wind for pollen grains. So the pollen grains are released or transferred by the wind. In order to catch the pollen grains, the stigma should be sticky. It is one of the characteristic features of anemophilous flowers. And each ovary contains a single ovule. Each ovary contains a single ovule. That is, these are certain characteristic features of anemophilous flowers. As I said, the flowers are usually small, without the color, nectar, smell. And the flowers are packed into inflorescence. They contain well exposed anthers. Anthers produce many number of pollen grains. And those pollen grains are usually small, light in weight, powdery, dry and non-sticky. The stigma is usually large and they are feathery and sticky to catch the pollen grains. And each ovary contains a single ovule. And these pollen grains, the pollen grains which are usually blown by the wind, blown by the wind and those pollen grains can able to travel up to uh, travel a distance up to several kilometers and I told you the stigma is feathery and sticky so uh, uh, we can say that feathery in the nature it is like a hairy I can give you one best example you may be uh, you may have seen in case of corn cob so whatever the tassels the hairy like structures you can see in a cob they are nothing but this style and stigma so many number of stigma that you can see in a corn, they are called as tassels and they usually wave in the wind to catch the wind worm pollen grains. So that is the characteristic feature of in case of maize. So you should remember this, in maize the hair like structures what you can see, they are nothing but stigma and style, they will be hanging or waving in the wind to catch the pollen grains. And this wind pollination is usually usually common in most of the grasses. So this is about anemophily. Here anemophily is important and the characteristic feature of anemophilous flowers is very very important. You may expect a question about the characteristic features of anemophilous flowers.
And in the next class, we will be taking the next thing that is hydrophilic.